pray now as we uh, read your word together, and as I talk about it, Lord, I pray you will speak to us and add to what you've already been speaking this morning. Open our ears and remove all distractions, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm going to preach with the book of Jude open in front of us this morning. So, some words that rarely get spoken. Please turn to the book of Jude. Not a book that is read very often by Christians, not a book that is preached on very often. And I started studying this months and months and months ago uh, in my own devotions. And I just felt stirring inside that, you know, it, it's, it's great when you're reading for yourself and, and, and you, you know, seeking God for your own personal life. But, you know, those of us that preach, we're always thinking, you know, what, 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 what's, what's next that God wants me to bring? And I just felt God saying, you know, yeah, you can preach on the book of Jude. Really? Jude's a hard book. It's, it's, it's not straightforward. And then Rob preached a sermon in July, so you don't always choose the easy option. <laughs> and I thought, yeah, okay, that's the clincher. So I am going to preach this morning on the book of Jude, and then my plans are to have another couple of sermons, which will be sometime in the, uh, in the early part of 2023, and we'll go through other bits of the book of Jude. So if you don't like my <laughs> preaching on the book of Jude, blame Rob for saying that I shouldn't take the easy option. Now, it is a challenging book, and it's a shame. It's neglected, and I, th I think there are some reasons for that. Uh, which I'll go through in a moment, and then you know I want us to read the whole book. And as I read it, you prob if you're not familiar with it, you might think, "Hang on, this is this is hard going." I'm not going to get bogged down in the details this morning. We're just going to really focus on the first two verses, and they're pretty straightforward. Uh, next time, I'm planning to preach on the next couple of verses, and then finally r r jump right to the end, the encouraging bits that Jude shares there to sort of spur us on. But, you know, there are hard bits in the book of Jude, let me say that. He mentions a few ancient writings that we, probably none of us in this room, know anything about. A book called The Assumption of Moses and a book called The Book of Enoch. Now, I've never read them, and I doubt that any of you have ever read them. You can get hold of them, they still exist, you know, down on the, off, off the internet or buy them from a specialist bookshop or something. But these are things that people were reading back at the time Jude was writing, 2,000 years ago. Yeah. Now, the fact that Jude refers to them doesn't mean these books are, you know, they ought to be part of our Bible. No. You know, any preacher today, including me probably this morning, will refer to things that are going on around us in our life. You know, might talk about something in politics or something in, in the world of sport, if you're interested in what's going on at the moment there. And we refer to it. Now, that's not saying, oh, the World Cup is inspired by God or, or, or that... Uh, Something that's in, in politics is, is inspired by God. No, we're just trying to, as preachers, we're trying to take things that are contemporary and share them so that the hearers can, can put those things into context and understand what they're reading. Now, if you took a sermon from today and read it in 50 years' time, you'd be thinking, what was that reference to? Who's that politician? What's that TV programme? Because those things don't last forever. It's only God's word that lasts forever. But that's one of the reasons why Jude's a little bit of a puzzling book. It's because he refers to some things that are, that are ancient and out of date and not really things that we know about now. So we're just going to focus on the bits that, that really are easier for us to understand. And Okay, that's a long winded introduction. Should we, should we read the whole chapter? Oh, by the way, after I finished on Jude, I'm putting down a marker now. I'm then planning to start doing some sermons on the book of Hebrews. So notice to all the other preachers, I'm claiming Hebrews. <laughs> I'm, 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 I'm claiming Hebrews because I really want to preach on the ministry of Jesus as it's described in that book. Now that's really fascinating for me because I think there's so much in Hebrews, I'll probably be on that for two or three years. And then we're getting into interesting times because I've got retirement in sight by then. And Karen and I may be making our plans to move on and, and so on. So uh, that's, that's, that's how I think things will, will, will pan out. But it's Jude for the moment. So let's read the whole of Jude. And as I say, if you feel this gets a bit starchy in the middle, don't worry. We're going to focus the sermon on verse 1 and verse 2. So here we go. Jude, a servant of Jesus Christ and a brother of James. To those who have been called who were loved by God the Father and kept by Jesus Christ. Mercy, peace and love be yours in abundance. 
Dear friends, although I was very eager to write to you about the salvation we share, I felt I had to write and urge you to contend for the faith that was once entrusted to the saints. For certain men, whose condemnation was written about long ago, have secretly slipped in among you. They are godless men, who change the grace of our God into a license for immorality, and deny Jesus Christ, our only Sovereign and Lord. Though you already know this, I want, you to, I want to remind you that the Lord delivered his people out of Egypt, but later destroyed those who did not believe. And the angels who did not keep their positions of authority, but abandoned their own home, these he has kept in darkness, bound with everlasting chains, for judgment on the great day. In a similar way, Sodom and Gomorrah and the surrounding towns gave themselves up to sexual immorality and perversion. They serve as an example of those who suffer the punishment of eternal fire. In the very same way, these dreamers pollute their own bodies, reject authority and slander celestial beings. But even the Archangel Michael, when he was disputing with the devil about the body of Moses, did not dare to bring, a, to bring a slanderous accusation against him, but said, The Lord rebuke you. Yet these men speak abusively against whatever they do not understand. And what things they do understand, by instinct, like unreasoning animals, these are the very things that destroy them. Woe to them! They have taken the way of Cain. They have rushed for profit into Balaam's error. They have been destroyed in Korah's rebellion. These men are blemishes at your love feasts, eating with you without the slightest qualm. Shepherds who feed only themselves, they are clouds without rain, blown along by the wind, autumn trees without fruit and uprooted, twice dead. They are wild waves of the sea, foaming up their shame, wandering stars for whom the blackest darkness has been reserved forever. Enoch, the seventh from Adam, prophesied about these men. See, the Lord is coming with thousands upon thousands of his holy ones, to judge everyone and to convict all the ungodly of all the ungodly acts they have done in the ungodly way, and of all the harsh words ungodly sinners have spoken against him. These men are grumblers and fault finders. They follow their own evil desires. They boast about themselves and flatter others for their own advantage. But dear friends, remember what the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ foretold. They said to you, in the last days there will be scoffers who will follow their own ungodly desires. These are the men who divide you who follow mere natural instincts and do not have the spirit. But you, dear friends, build yourselves up in the most holy faith. Pray in the Holy Spirit. Keep yourselves in God's love as you wait for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ to bring you to eternal life. Be merciful to those who doubt. Snatch others from the fire and save them. To others show mercy mixed with fear, hating even the clothing stained by corrupted flesh. And to him who is able to keep you from falling, and to present you before his glorious presence without fault and with great joy. To the only God, our Saviour, be glory, majesty, power and authority through Jesus Christ our Lord, before all ages, now and forevermore. Amen. Amen. We got there. Did you get a bit lost halfway through there? It gets a little bit, a little bit complex, doesn't it? But this is the book of Jude. There are a few books in the New Testament that we often overlook. Some of the smaller ones, 2 Peter, uh, sorry, sorry, 2 John, 3 John, but, but Jude's longer than those, and yet it gets overlooked. It's a shame. I get worried when Christians have parts of the Bible they never read. If it's in God's word, if God wants to speak to us by it, why are we neglecting it? And I don't know if you picked up as we read that through, the main theme that Jude has when he starts to develop it is that his readers, the Christians, need to be sure they're holding on to the truth and they are not distracted by false teachings and manipulative people, people with false objectives and so on. And, you know, as Angela was saying about her son, sometimes we do have to stand up and say, no, that's not right what you're saying. We want to follow the truth as God has declared it, as God has written it in his word. So that's what Jude is saying his, his main message is. And we'll get onto that in due course, but not this morning. We're going to start just with the first couple of verses. So can you go to the next slide? This is how I'm going to frame it this morning. We're going to start by thinking about who is Jude? What do we know about him? What's his background? Not just for a history lesson. I'm not into that. It's going to challenge us. I want to look into our own hearts. What can we learn from this guy, Jude? Secondly, what does he say about us? Who are we? And then thirdly, what are the things that he wishes for the people he's writing to? We're reading his letter, so that's for us as well. So first of all, who is Jude? Who's this guy who's, who's written this letter? <coughs> 
First thing is, his name's not actually Jude. Now that's confusing. His name is Judas. And when they translated the Bible into English, the people translating it all those years ago when it was first done thought, English people are a bit stupid, aren't they? If, if we call this book Judas, they're going to think it's Judas Iscariot, one of the disciples who betrayed Jesus. So they took that Greek name, Judas, which in Hebrew would have been Judah, and they said, right, we'll, we'll, we'll call him Jude, so those thick Christians in, in England don't get confused by it. So his mom and dad would have called him Judas. But, you know, for us, it's Jude and has been for centuries now, and that's the way it's going to stick for us. But even that doesn't help us to fully understand who is Jude, who is this guy, because there's, there's probably half a dozen chaps called Judas dotted around through the New Testament. Is this, is this one on? Uh, yeah, it will be. Is that okay? Oh. Yeah. I did that. Yeah. Do I just get the volume a little bit, <laughs> a bit more under control? Okay, okay. okay. all right. So there's, there's, there's probably half a dozen chaps in the New Testament who are called Judas. So which one is this that's written this letter? Because he doesn't give us much to go on. He says, Jude, a servant of Jesus Christ and a brother of James. Okay, so who's James? Well, almost any evangelical Christian, Bible, teacher and scholar is going to be absolutely black and white about who James is and who Judas is. The only person in the Bible who's referred to as James without some sort of explanation, you know, James, the brother of John and that sort of stuff, is James who wrote the book of James. And interestingly, he is the brother of Jesus. Or if you like, the half brother of Jesus. Yeah. Jesus was born to Mary, but Joseph wasn't his real dad, Joseph was his stepdad because of the virgin birth. So James is the half-brother of Jesus. So Judas is part of Jesus' human family. So I put it there on a, verse from, a couple of verses from Mark chapter 6, verses 2 to 3. When the Sabbath came, he, that's Jesus, began to teach in the synagogue, and many who heard him were amazed. Where did this man get these things, they asked? Where, what's this wisdom that's been given him that he even does miracles? Isn't this the carpenter? Isn't this Mary's son and the brother of James, Joseph, Judas, and Simon? Aren't his sisters here with us? And they took offence at him. It's something we don't often think about, that Jesus grew up not just with a, a mom and dad. It's quite likely that Joseph died while Jesus was young, but we can't be certain about that. But Jesus grew up in that family, but he wasn't an only child. Mary went on to have other kids, younger brothers and younger sisters to Jesus. Sisters is plural, so there's at least two of those. And we've got the brothers that are listed there. So this is the family that Jesus grew up in. And there you've got your James, and you've got your Judas. <coughs> it tickles me when I see that Mary and Joseph have a thing about calling their kids with a name beginning with J. You know, <laughs> poor Mary, this is my husband, Joseph. This is my boy, Jesus. And another boy, Joseph. And another boy, James. And another boy, Judas. They, they, they got a bit bored by the time they got signed, didn't they? <laughs> but, you know, and I like to think that the sisters, you know, they were probably called Judith and, uh, and, and, and Jennifer and Janet. Don't write that down, I made that up. Okay, let's, but, and, and in a strange way, oh, this is my mind here, but this makes me think of the Kardashians now. I mean, because, you know, all of that Kardashian family, they, all their names begin with K. You're going to have to help me, Rob, here. Chloe, Kim, Kendall, Kylie, um, I'm not sure. If, if you know more Kardashians than that, we'll pray for you afterwards. That's, yeah. that's, that, that really, really is quite worrying. But, um, but we've got this whole family growing up. Jesus as the older brother, but all the, the siblings around him. And, and, and that's our Judas. That's who's going to write the letter that we've been reading this morning. Let's jump on to the next verse, Mark, please. So this is from a little bit earlier in Mark, but it gives us an insight into how the family reacted to Jesus. Jesus entered a house, and again, a crowd gathered so that he and his disciples were not even able to eat. When his family heard about this, they went to take charge of him, for they said, he is out of his mind. So, 
At this time, when Jesus is ministering, between the ages of about 30 and 33, Judas and James and the other brothers and the unnamed sisters thought Jesus was mad. They weren't that impressed by him. I haven't got the verse up there. Could somebody find, I think it's John 7, verse 5. If that looks right, could somebody find that and read that out? If it looks wrong, tell me and I'll find out what the reference is. I'm racing you now, see if I get there first. Even his own brothers did not believe in him. Wow. You know, we had a couple of sermons earlier in the year, Mark brought one and Steve brought one, thinking about the early life of Jesus and the, you know, what we know about it. But this is not so much the early life of Jesus, but this is when Jesus is starting his ministry and his family aren't on his side. I think Mary was. But the brothers and the sisters were not that impressed by Jesus. Didn't believe in him, so they didn't follow him. They thought he was mad. <coughs> and yet Judas wrote us a letter here as a Christian leader, encouraging other Christians. There's been a transformation. The Judas who didn't believe in Jesus does believe in Jesus. So what's gone on there? Well, we do not know about how Judas became a Christian. Let's have a look at what we do know about his brother James. We've gone to the next verse. 1 Corinthians 15, verses 3 to 8. This is Paul writing. For what I received, I passed on to you as of first importance, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures. He was buried, and he was raised on the third day according to the Scriptures. And then he appeared to Peter, and then to the twelve. After that, he appeared to more than 500 of the brothers at the same time, most of whom were still living, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles, and last of all, he appeared to me also, as to one abnormally born. Maybe James was a Christian at this point, or maybe it's part of him becoming a Christian, but there's a transformation. After Jesus has died, after Jesus has risen again, he makes a point of appearing not just to his disciples, but to various groups of people, including his brother James, <coughs> maybe he did to Judas as well, Judas, Jude. We're not quite sure, but it's that transformation I want us to really think about this morning. Because growing up in the family of Jesus, all those brothers and sisters would have known the Christmas story. Maybe they hated it, <coughs> being told how special Jesus was when he was born, being told that when he was born, some rich men came and gave him gold. Yes. <laughs> Didn't happen for them, did it? You know, there's, there's all sorts of jealousy and suspicion and snide comments and all the rest of it, but they knew the Christmas story. But knowing the Christmas story didn't make them believers. Knowing the Christmas stories didn't give them the right, the full impression of Jesus. It's when Jesus died, rose again, and they saw him in victory that ultimately they were changed. Maybe it was the day they saw him, maybe it was weeks after, months after, I don't know. We'll find out one day. But clear, simple point I want to make this morning for all of us in the room and particularly for anyone that might be watching um, who's not part of church regularly. It's not enough just to know the Christmas story. It's not enough just to be able to say, oh, I know this about Jesus and I know that about Jesus. The real crunch comes when I ask, what do you think about the fact that Jesus died for you, rose again, and he's now King of Kings and Lord of Lords? How do you react to that? If you react to that by following him, making him your Lord, you've had the same transformation as James and Jude. And if you haven't, I can only be blunt, you're not a Christian. Many people have a single moment in their life and they can pin it down. At that moment I prayed, I became a Christian. For some people it takes a little bit of a process over weeks or months or even years. But there is a change. There is a change when we stop just knowing about Jesus, stop just thinking about Jesus, stop just singing about Jesus, and we actually react to him as King, Saviour and Lord. And we say, you're the boss, I serve you. That's what happened to Jude. So that's who Jude was. 
a member of Jesus' family, birth family, natural family, but that's not so much the important thing, because like you and me, he had to come to the point where he said, now I believe, now I follow, now Jesus is my Lord. That's the first thing I wanted to say about who Jude is. He's part of that family, a brother of James. But the second thing is, if we go to the next slide, please, Mark. Oh, go on, move on, we'll jump to that one. Oh, go on, let me just go over these. Just a little, little mini sermonette I want to throw out here, just from my thinking about this, this, this family, this Mary Joseph, the, the sons and the daughters. Number one, being related to a strong Christian doesn't absolve you of the need to be born again yourself. Your mum and dad can have been Christians all their lives. All your brothers and sisters can be Christians. You've got to sort it out for yourself. You've got to follow God for yourself. There's a saying, some of you will have heard it, God doesn't have any grandchildren. The children of Christians need to become God's children in their own right. Not God's grandchildren, but God's children in their own right. Number two, if you've got non-Christians in your family, you're in good company, so did Jesus. Have you thought about that? They thought he was mad. Your, your non-saved family probably think you're mad and Jesus is mad. You know, Jesus can take that on the chin. He's been taking it on the chin for 2,000 years. And thirdly, it's not enough to hear the teachings of Jesus and see him as a nice moral leader. What makes or breaks a person when it comes to the Christian faith is how they react to the statement that Jesus died and rose again. That's a little three-point mini-sermon out there. Okay, let's move on. So James, sorry, Jude says, I'm a brother of James. Oh, thanks, Jude. That helps us to pin down who you are. The only other way he describes himself is, I'm a servant of Jesus Christ. That blows my mind. Because if I was Jude, <laughs> I'd be wanting to expand on that a little bit. Just imagine that you went to some Christian gathering back in you know, the year 70 or something like that. And I said, hey, hey, meet this guy, this is Jude. And you say, oh, I'm a, I, I'm a Christian, I've been following Jesus for five years. If I was Jude, I'd be saying, oh, you've known Jesus for five years. <laughs> <laughs> I grew up with him. <laughs> we used to share a room together. <laughs> we used to kick a ball round in the yard. I was better at football than Jesus was. <laughs> we used to call him Big J. He used to call the rest of us Little J, because I named him again. <laughs> no, I made that up as well. But... Um, you know, that's what we'd want to do. We'd want to name drop. We'd want to, we'd want to puff our chest up and say, I've got these credentials. Not Jude. He said, I'm a servant of Jesus. I'm a servant of my big brother. I haven't got a brother. I've got a sister. So, older than me, smaller than me, louder than me. <laughs> My relationship with Sue is probably like many of you have a relationship with your siblings. We get on and we have a laugh together and then the moment can flip and we're in a big argument with each other. You know, it's that, that sort of relationship. I seriously can't imagine myself ever describing me as a servant of Sue. And I can't imagine Sue describing herself as a servant of David. I'm just being quite honest there. Jude humbly said, I'm a servant of my brother. I'm a servant of Jesus Christ. What a heart. What a heart. That's got to get inside us and challenge us. I put the second part on the, um, the slide there, a verse from John 3, chapter 30. This is John the Baptist speaking. And John the Baptist, before Jesus became famous and Jesus started his ministry, John the Baptist was preparing the way. He was prophesying. He was explaining Messiah is coming and John the Baptist was popular. Crowds flocked to see John the Baptist. It's interesting, John the Baptist made no effort to be popular. He lived in the wilderness, he didn't wash his clothes, he ate a weird diet, he probably smelled. And yet crowds wanted to be where John the Baptist was, to follow him, to hear him. And then Jesus started and suddenly Jesus has all the popularity and John is going a little bit out of fashion. How are you going to cope with that, John? And John said, it's okay. Jesus must become greater and greater, and I must become 
less and less. Put a picture there of the Gospel of John. It's not just any old picture of any old Gospel of John. If I'm, I've got it here. Bear with me. <coughs> it's that Gospel of John. When I was a teenager, and this story goes back about 40 years, it might have been 39, it might have been 41, something like that, I took this little booklet and I went for a walk. In my memory it was a Saturday afternoon, but it's a long time ago, so forgive me if I've got that wrong. And I went with a view to sitting down in a park and reading the whole Gospel of John. And I did that. I was only a teenager and I didn't know the Bible then as well as I do now, so there were lots of things that, oh, yeah, I've never seen that before. God spoke to me that day through this little booklet, through John chapter 3 and verse 30. I went home and I underlined it. It's the only verse that is underlined in this booklet. This is the Living Bible, not my favourite translation, but, uh, but it's good enough. He must become greater and greater, and I must become less and less. Now if I showed you my normal Bible, which I have been using for equally as long. <laughs> There's all sorts of verses underlined, all sorts of notes in the margin. I wish I'd put dates against a lot of them, because I look at some of them and think, when did that happen? When, you know, why did I do that? But I know for this one, it was as a teenager, and God gave me a verse that was going to be key. David, Jesus must be the one that's greater. David, you need to become less and less. <coughs> The spirit of John the Baptist, the spirit of Jude, is to be a servant of Jesus. And you know, it's a challenge. It really is. I remember when I was involved in the youth work in this church, and we used to have a very large and very successful Thursday evening youth group. I was the leader of it, but I hadn't found it yet. I picked it up from our previous pastor, Pete Wook, and he founded it decades ago with a team of people around him. And we would have regularly 30 youngsters here sometimes 50 or 60 youngsters here, week in, week out. Sometimes we were praying that God would stop sending extra kids in because we were, we were out of control. And it was phenomenal. And I would go take the kids to camps and you know, we'd need to be hiring minibuses and all sorts of stuff to get them there because of the numbers that we had. And it was a constant challenge for me. Yes, to leave this, but as I pray for it to continue to be successful, am I doing it purely for his glory? Or is there any seed in my heart that is saying, this looks good for me, doesn't it? When you meet with other Christians at a camp, oh yeah, we've got 30 in our group, we've got 50 in our group, and so on. You get into that competitive game. The challenge is, can I really say with Jude, I'm just doing everything I do as a servant of him. Can I say with John the Baptist, I want him to be greater. I don't want me to be less. It's a challenge, but we must do it, folks. Let me put it this way. How would you react if God sent revival to Dorchester Baptist Church next year? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. <laughs> yeah, hallelujah. It's not all about us. It's not all about me. And it's not all about people looking at me. It's about God doing what God wants to do. And him being glorified. I hope he sends them revival and us, but that's, that's what we pray for. But you know, God does what God wants to do. If there's any seed in your heart of, this will look good for me, get on your knees. Get on your knees and pray that God will root out and destroy the pride, the self-focus, and the arrogance that you just want him to be glorified. Often I think that is the key to a breakthrough. Marty Muller Jones, the, uh, the famous preacher, was mentoring R.T. Kemble, who was going to take over from him. And uh, Marty Muller Jones' advice was, amongst many things I'm sure, but R.T. Kemble kept on quoting it. Um, Lord Jones used to say, it's very dangerous for a young minister to have success too early. Because they accidentally, it might not be deliberate, but they start thinking, I'm good, aren't I? God must be really, really pleased with me. Instead of thinking, I can do nothing without him. Yeah. And Archie Kendall's in his age, he's now probably mentoring plenty of other people. But you know, it's good advice. Don't seek 
success and fame and popularity. Let's have a couple of quotes. Um, I've got a dozen to these, so I just thought I'd put them all onto one slide here. So William Carey on the left, he was a Baptist missionary, he went to India, one of the pioneer missionaries in India. On his deathbed, he said this, when I am gone, don't talk about William Carey, talk about William Carey's saviour. I desire that Christ alone might be magnified. May that be our hearts. On the right, George Whitfield. <sighs> I've got a soft spot for George Whitfield. I don't know if you can see it on that picture, he had the most almighty squint. And the portraits of him are absolutely blunt and honest. He's as cross-eyed as you can imagine. Just not the sort of man that anyone would want to flock to hear, and crowds flock to hear him. This is in the 1800s, he was a revivalist. Um, English guy, but did a lot of stuff over in America, part of the Great Awakening over there. Preached 18,000 sermons. And I sort of think, you know, if God can use a preacher with a squint like that, he can use me with a black country accent to actually bring something that's, that's, that's actually going to, you know, make a difference. And he said, this, you know, this was a, a successful revivalist. Pray that I may be very little in my own eyes and not rob my dear master of any part of his glory. <coughs> may that be our heart, because we are servants of God. And then to be a lot more modern, down at the bottom there, Great collective, the, um, the Irish, folky, Christian, lively sort of band. Chris Llewellyn is one of their musicians. <laughs> and I read this just earlier in the year. Talking about John 3.30, he must become greater and I must become less. And uh, Chris said, while I've met lots of Christians who want to make Jesus greater, I'm not sure how many want to become less in order to achieve this. Honestly, I'm not even fully sure I want to become less of a kingdom. Honest, isn't it? Someone who's got faith and has got popularity and sold music, could see the challenge. Are we really doing it all for his glory? And if the secret of him getting more glory is for me to become even less, then am I prepared to embrace that? You know, when John the Baptist said he must become greater and I must become less, it's in the context of John the Baptist talking about the joy he had. He said, now my joy is complete. He must become greater and I must become less. You are not going to find joy if you are looking for popularity. You are not going to find joy if you're looking for what Rob talked about earlier in the year about an easy path. It's the pathway of sacrificing all for him. That's the pathway to joy. Hallelujah. We're, 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 we're yeah, she had a look at the clock, but uh, there we go. Um, oh yeah, I've got one more, one more little picture, a little light distraction here. I'm a Downton Abbey fan, I don't know if, 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 if others are, but one thing I learned from Downton Abbey is that when stately home people, we've all got friends like that, haven't we? <laughs> when stately home people had a huge party of visitors come to stay, of course the visitors would come, Lord this and Lady that, they'd come with all their servants. So the house has now got its own resident posh people and servants, and suddenly it's got visitors, posh people and servants. So, according to Dan Abbey, it was written by um, our, our local uh, uh, neighbour, Julian Fellows, was that um, they would call all of the visiting servants by the surname of their master. So, if Alan and Denise's servants came with Alan and Denise and stayed in our house, I would be calling Alan's valet Trowbridge. And Denise's lady's maid Trowbridge because it was just impossible to learn everybody's names. So the servants took on the names of their master. Now I'm not saying that's the way we should go back to or anything like that, but nice little picture for us as Christians, isn't it? What name do you want to make? Your own name or Jesus' name? What name do you want to see lifted up high? What name do you want to see honoured? Of course it's Jesus's, it's Jesus's. Okay, I'm going to speed things up, so don't worry, I'm not going to be as long on the second and third points as I was on the first. But, uh, so who was Jude? We've answered that, not just for history, but to challenge ourselves. Have we got the same heart as Jude? To be servants of Jesus. Secondly, what does, Jesus, what does Jude say about us? So he's writing his letter, he's described himself, brother of James, servant of Jesus, and he's writing to those who have been called, who are loved by God the Father, and kept by Jesus Christ. Called, kept, 
Sorry, called, loved, and kept. I'll get them in the right order there. That's a way in which Jude described all Christians. Jude, by the way, loves putting things in little groups of three. So if ever you read the book on your own, you'll spot little groups of three that come, you know, repeatedly. Called, loved, and kept. You are called. You are called by God. You're not an accident that God sort of, oh, I regret ever letting them become a Christian. My church would be stronger if they weren't in it. No, you are called by him. You know the thing on TV programmes, the sort of competition programmes or reality programmes, and it's become such a trope now that you get to that point where the announcer's got to say, and the winner is, or, and going through to the next round is, and the lights go dim, and that moody music, that heavy beat starts, and then there's the longest pause, <laughs> and the winner is... <coughs> I'm sure they're at a competition amongst themselves to see who can get away with having the longest gap before they say, you're chosen. Well, I can say with no pause, you're chosen, you're chosen, you're chosen, you're chosen, you're chosen. We are the called of God. Be encouraged. We are the called of God. Do you know what? I'm going to, going to leave that one there and move on quite quickly just because of, uh, of, of time. Next one is we are loved. God loves us. Again, another one of Rob's sermons from earlier in the year. This was, this was um, in August, just emphasising again and again, Jesus loves us. He just can't help himself. He loves us. I think I've got a picture on this slide, haven't I? Yeah. We had a postcard. This is one I've dropped earlier on. We had a postcard from Care for the Family come through our uh, letterbox earlier in the week. And I love Care for the Family, the, the whole ministry. I've been following them for years. And, um, and there's the postcard, it came to us, and it says, remember you are special because I made you and I don't make mistakes. Oh, that's lovely, isn't it? That's really nice. And then I went to Alan Denise's house for the house group on, on, on Wednesday, and they've got exactly the same one on their mantel, mantelpiece. And, and I was sat right opposite it, and I, I was thinking, can I make a joke here? And I was thinking of saying something like, well, I felt really special when I received that. <laughs> but, but you know what, if you're special as well, then it doesn't amount to much, does it? And, and I wanted to make that joke, and, and I didn't, because I, you know, that's the sort of person that I am. But can I say with absolute seriousness this morning, we are all special. We are all loved. With an absolute bottomless pit of love that God's got for bottomless heart of love, that's a bit much better word, bottomless heart of love that he has for us. Do you know that? Do you sense that? Do you get up each morning with that feeling, God loves me? The sky's grey, it's cold, I've got work to do. Yeah, there's all that stuff, but God loves you. You are the loved of God. Oh, let's grasp it. Let's really, really grasp it. Okay, I'm going to move on quickly. The third one is that he is, we are kept. He keeps us. We are the called, the loved, and the kept. Again, that's something that we should be absolutely overjoyed with. We've all got burdens. We've all got hassles and hang-ups. We've had something go wrong in the house this week that we had to quickly, oh, how are we going to sort this out? You know, these things come along our path and they rock us and they upset us and all the rest of it. Very often our prayer life is, God, will you take my burdens away? Sometimes I think we need to just, as well as praying for God to take our burdens away, I'm all in favour of that. But we need to realise that God's keeping us through our burdens. God's keeping us in spite of our burdens. Church, every one of you, you are called loved and kept. Amen. Finally, what does Jude wish for us? In all those fairy tales where there's a genie or a, you know, a fairy, I'll give you three wishes. You know, I'm not going to ask you what you would ask for if you had that opportunity. I'll give you three wishes. Jude had three wishes here. He said, may mercy, peace and love be yours in abundance. I don't think those were just randomly chosen words that Jude was just sort of writing with a bit of flourish. Oh, that is the standard thing I put in letters. I think this came from his heart. 
He wanted the people that were going to read his letters to truly know mercy, to truly know peace, and to truly know love. Meaningful, heartfelt. Is it a prayer? I think it is a prayer. It's more than a wish. May my readers really walk each day rooted, strong, confident in the mercy, the peace, and the love of God. Why do we need mercy? Well, we, you, it, 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 it sounds almost obvious. I've got the verse on the next one, 1 John. Yeah, 1 John 1, verses 8 to 9. This is written to Christians here. If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins. I still need to walk in God's forgiveness. I still need his mercy to cleanse me day in and day out from the things I do that are sinful from the things I don't do that are sinful and from the attitudes that I have and the thoughts that I have and the things that I say, etc, etc. Thank God that his mercies are new every morning. But may we know his mercy, as Jude says, in abundance. Not take it for granted, but walk in it. You see, it's mercy, it's through mercy that I became a Christian. But it's through mercy that I continue as a Christian. May we know that mercy. And I am aware that Christmas is coming just around the corner. And what struck me as I start to wrap up now and think about these phrases, mercy, peace and love, these are very Christmassy words. <coughs> Mercy is at the heart of the Christmas message. And I quoted there from the song that Mary sang, the Magnificat, that we get in Luke. More and more as I go through my Advent devotions over recent years, this song of Mary's is blowing my mind. This teenage girl who just expressed with such poetry and prophetic insights what God was doing. I just sort of think, wow. I, 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 I wish I could talk to her. I wish she could, could explain a few things to me and share her heart because she grasped something in the middle of her confusion and surprise and all the rest of it. But as well as many things that she said in, in the song the Magnificat, she says, His mercy extends to those who fear him from generation to generation. And later on, he has helped his servant Israel, remembering to be merciful. She knew she was standing at a point in history where God's mercy was about to be unleashed on the world that needed it. What about peace? Mercy, peace and love. <coughs> we put our Christmas decorations away in Jan January, I guess it was. So I can't remember exactly when. But we never put them all away. And I don't know if this is by design or just that, you know, you sort of sit there afterwards and think, oh, we forgot that one, didn't we? <laughs> But all through the year, we've had on one of our cabinets to the right-hand side of our fireplace um, a, a candle holder. It's a wooden stand. It's about 12 inches long. And at one end is the candle, and at the other end, in, in silver letters, is the word peace. It's meant to be Christmassy, but we've had it up all year long. Can I say that peace is for life, not just for Christmas? Yeah. <laughs> and peace is a thing that challenges me at Christmas time because we know that peace is promised as part of the Christmas story. Isaiah prophesied about the Prince of Peace. The angels were singing to the shepherds, declaring to the shepherds, peace. Peace to men on whom his favour rests, I think is the, um, is, 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 is the phrase there. And I stand here on, I think, you know, day 284 or something of the Ukraine war. I think, where's the peace? Where is the peace? But Jude prays, and we need to seek the peace of God in our lives. Peace is a Christmas concept. Over the coming few weeks, you're going to hear the word peace in carols and in Christmas readings and all the rest of it. Don't just let it wash over you, grasp hold of it. Jude prayed, may they know peace in abundance. May you know peace in abundance. May we all know his peace in abundance. And then we've got love again. Love was in the first set when Jude said we called, loved and kept. And now in the second set he says, may you know mercy, peace and love. So you're loved, but may you know that love in abundance. Love is in the Christmas story as well. This is a weird one for me, this, this poem here. And um, I think God's trying to 
wake me up to something because over the last couple of weeks I just keep coming across this same poem and, and I don't know why I mean I've known of it for a while but, but yeah, yeah why something else I opened up something yesterday there it was same poem quoted by someone it's written by Christina Rossetti who wrote the poem In the Bleak Midwinter that was set to music and becomes a carol no, we won't go about that. We have arguments in our family about which is the best tune for that one. But, um, but Rossetti wrote the words, and she also wrote this one. I actually think it's a fairly rubbish poem. Love came down at Christmas. Love all lovely, love divine. That's what I think a child could do better than that. But the sentiment of it is just saying, look, Christmas is God's love. Christmas is God's love. I'm told that there's, there's plenty of carol tunes to this one. It's been set to music. How many times? I've never sung it, but I'm just wondering how many times, because it's been happening a lot the last fortnight, but how many times over the next three weeks I'm going to still keep coming across this poem and just sort of, oh, here we go again. But, you know, what I want to say to you folks and, and to myself here is that these things that Jude is praying for his readers to know, mercy, peace and love, they are words that we're going to hear so much over the next few weeks. Don't just let them be words. Stop. Pray. Receive. And here's how I want us to finish this morning, because I have finished. In a moment, I'm going to ask that we all stand up. And you just stretch and loosen yourselves up a little bit. And then, without moving from where you are, I want you to look around the room. And I want you to just... So if you, you guys at the back, I might ask you to just come out of your little hiding place there. I want us all to be in sight, and I want you to look, and I want you to prayerfully ask God, drop one or two people in my heart, because over this Advent season, I'm going to pray for them. Maybe it will be for mercy. Maybe it will be for peace. Maybe it will be for love. Maybe it will be for one of the other Christmas words. Joy. Hope. Whatever. Be open to God that God will show you one or two people that you can pray for. Now, and we'll pray quietly, but also over the next couple of weeks. Because very often when we're praying for each other, we pray about things, don't we? We pray about illnesses, and we pray about stuff at work, and we pray about doctor's appointments. Fantastic. But wouldn't, wouldn't it be great if we pray for each other to really know God's peace and love and joy and God did it. Wouldn't that be great? Wouldn't that be great? So, and, and that's all I'm going to say. How it goes beyond that, I'm giving that to you and I'm giving that over to God. I was thinking in my mind this would be a little bit like a secret Santa thing no one needs to know other than you. But if you want to go and tell someone I'm going to be praying for you to have peace. That's fine. If you think you need to tell them, do it. But more important than the telling is the praying. That we pray for each other. That we hold each other up. So God, as we close now and we just give ourselves a few minutes to look at each other, our brothers and sisters in this room, Lord, we open our hearts and our minds to your Holy Spirit. We pray that you will guide us, Lord, who we, who, me as an individual, who I can pray for, and do that for each one of us, Lord. That it won't just be a token gesture, but we'll pray in the Holy Spirit, in the build-up to Christmas, as these weeks are going to race on by so quickly. We want to pray with a heart that really is desperate to see you pour out your blessings in abundance, just like Jude wanted. May his readers no. Peace, joy, love, etc., etc. Oh, Father, we pray that you'll speak to us now. Holy Spirit, come and minister in this room as we just want your promptings to show us who we can pray for. Amen. So stand up.